So I'm very glad you brought that up. You spoke about Paul Farmer. I'm very interested in how you see the, you know, the, the things playing out politically with this commission co-chaired by Clinton, who you're very critical of. Uh, Paul Farmer, in a way, made the step to be formal part of this by being the right hand of Clinton. So um, should he, what about his participation in the uh, commission with Clinton and others? Yeah, well, I was wondering, I mean, this, this seems such an odd, odd couple, <laughs> and at the same time, so much is riding on this, right? I mean, we have a government that's not really functional. Uh, we have the Clintons who have been promoting plans that probably most of us don't like, sweatshops and this kind of thing. And then we have Paul Farmer there popping up, who is taking the lead, talking to NGOs and so on. And I'm trying to find out which direction is this going. Is Clinton going to listen to Paul Farmer? Is Paul Farmer really influential? Did he make the wrong step to be part of this political forum? Please. I'm sure he's cutting corners, but uh, you know, I personally trust him. I think he's probably making the right decisions. I don't know exactly what's going on in that commission. It's nobody. It's secret, you know. But uh, you can see that there must be internal conflicts. Uh, he knows perfectly well what Clinton's record was, and uh, he's decided, I suspect for good reasons, that it's uh, the best of bad alternatives now is to cooperate with it and see if it can be moved into a, a, a healthier direction for the people of Haiti. And I think he has good judgment, and so without knowing the details, I kind of assume that what he's doing is the right thing. And do you see the Haitian government really playing a role in this reconstruction? Do, I see, do you see the Haitian government? The Haitian, as, government, as, yeah, the Haitian as we, government barely exists, you know, unfortunately, you know. I mean, it's, first it's got to exist, you know, then. Um, thank you so much. And I also have sort of another question that might be, seem sort of vague and abstract, and I think you've some, someone addressed it. But, and what would you say that pragmatic solidarity, going back to Paul Farmer, really consists? I mean, um, kind of on a daily basis, he writes that when we regard the perpetrators of structural violence from a comfortable reserve, we automatically yeah, I'm not, have... Sorry, but I'm not hearing very well. I'm sorry. Um, so going back to Paul Farmer, I wanted to ask what you would say pragmatic solidarity consists in. I mean, in general, about solidarity work? Yeah, I mean, what would you say it consists in on a daily basis, I guess, pragmatically speaking? Yeah. I, I, I kind of don't think there's a lot that can be said at a sort of an abstract level. You've got to go to the particular cases. And so take, say, the case of Monsanto Seeds. Okay, here's a case where solidarity work can do something very constructive. Uh, for one thing, it can spread understanding among the population about what this means. It's not a charitable gift from Monsanto and the United States. It's a way to ensure that Haitian farmers remain captives. And second, you can do something to counter it, like the uh, program of uh, organizing seeds. And the same in case after case. You just can't say anything general. You have to work through the cases and figure out what's the way to uh, uh, interact with suffering people so as to help them, not to help NGOs, as somebody pointed out. It's, uh, you, at least I don't know how to make a general comment on it. Yeah, it, I mean, just, it, also it really just depends on the particular case. And, and each case has to be thought about because they all have consequences. And bringing pressure to bear on elected officials and things like that. I mean, how much, I mean, I guess organizing and protesting is one thing, but... One, one day protest and so on. What about a protest? I mean, organizing and protesting is one thing, but how effective do you think that is? Well, you know, a protest makes sense if it's part of an ongoing activity. Uh, a protest which is just of the kind that, unfortunately, we have too many of. Uh, I'm going out and protest, and then I'll go back home and go back to my ordinary life. Uh, that's a kind of a feel-good protest. Uh, but the kind of protest that took place, say, in Cochabamba about the privatization of water, that's a real protest. Uh, because, yes, they did have demonstration that day, but then the next day they went on and did something else. So if protests are part of you know, an active, on, ongoing engagement, yeah, it's, it can be very valuable. So like take, say, the anti-war protests in, uh, in the late 60s. 
Uh, they were events, at least for the serious people. They were single events which just brought people together, mobilized them, you know, made themselves visible as part of uh, the day-to-day -day activities that they were engaged in, educational activists and so on. And that's, that's what protests ought to be. Uh, otherwise, it's, uh, it's kind of like, uh, I'll feel good, I'll see my friends. You know. Regarding Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea, can it not be said that the United States gave them a great deal of slack because of the dire communist threat owing to the Chinese Revolution and the Korean War? And I suppose that could also be said of Germany and Western Europe. I mention this because the U.S. allowed import and other controls and some light industry in the Philippines under President Carino in the late 1940s because of the communist hoopla threat at the time. You're talking about Taiwan. And then... You're talking about Taiwan. Right, right, yeah. but I'm contrasting. Yeah. And then in the Philippines, then they forced full the control yeah. under President Macapagal in 1960 once the communist threat was crushed. Now, however, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Egypt, and Jordan, the favored method to counter the Islamic threat seems to be massive bribery. Yeah. Look, I'm not suggesting that Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, and so on are lovely models to follow. Uh, in fact, uh, you're right. I mean, the United States gave them a certain slack to violate the rules because of, for geopolitical reasons. But the point that I was making is a different one they developed by following the same, basically the same principles that the United States and other developed societies uh, applied, and by violating uh, the rules that are imposed on the weak. They didn't do it in a pretty way, by any means, like South Korea was a terrible dictatorship, which the U.S. backed. Uh, but uh, th that's how they developed. And the countries that do not have sovereignty, do not control their own economic uh, life, and cannot enter the market, and do not have the capacity to enter the market on their own terms, they became the third world. Okay. In fact, it, it, Japan, remember, developed long before it started developing in the late 1860s. Uh, and in fact, rather strikingly, at the time that Japan began its process of modernization and industrialization, they were roughly in the same stage of uh, state formation, uh, economic uh, growth, and so on, as West Africa. It's been discussed by a number of African historians correctly, I think. They were approximately in the same state. Well, Japan developed. West Africa became a monstrosity. Why? It was under colonial control. Did not have sovereignty. Uh, there are many other such cases. Now, take, say, Egypt. If you go back to around the 1820s, uh, Egypt was poised for economic development and industrialization, and it was, you know, can't can't uh, draw connections too closely, but it was roughly in the same state as the United States. It had a rich agriculture. Uh, that's why Napoleon conquered it. Uh, it had cotton, uh, uh, rich resources of cotton, which were very important then. It had a national government, Ahmad Ali's government, which was starting a program of uh, modernization, industrialization, roughly at the same time the United States did.